this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind. And today we are here with Dr. the, the wonderful and beautiful Dr. Amber Makaal. And um, she is here to talk to us about teaching um, ethics and teaching philosophy. And isn't that a wonder, aren't, aren't those wonderful um, topics for today? Because in our world where we're seeing wars and craziness in our politics, um, ethics come to mind almost all the time, much and, and, and as well, you know, a, a philosophical approach to life. Uh, so um, let me make a, a brief introduction. Our guest is uh, Director of Curriculum and Research for the Ui Hiro Academy for Philosophy and Ethics at uh, the University of Hawaii, but also she is Director of the Professional Research Center um, at the uh, Hanahaoli School here in Honolulu. So Amber, welcome. And um, my first question to you is, uh, describe your journey. How did you get to Hawaii? Uh, have you been, did you, were you born and raised here? And uh, how did you get to these two wonderful communities? Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Ackerman. I came to Hawaii as I was born and raised here. Um, I am the descendant of missionaries that came in the 1820s. And so I'm actually sixth generation here in Hawaii. And my ancestors came to be educators at the Chief's Children's School. So they were the teachers for uh, the ali'i. And I like to think that this lineage of education has led me on my professional journey uh, for the rest of my life and what I tap into um, for my own genealogy and thinking about who I am as an educator. Uh, I attended a small progressive school also in here in Honolulu. And uh, that school really gave me the grounding of what I have come to believe uh, in terms of what is the purpose of schooling. And that school is Hanahaoli School. And I'll talk a little bit more about it on our program here today. And was that was that chief school, Punahou School, um, or was it a, a different school? It was the Royal School. So this was the school that was um, for the kings and queens children um, at a time period, an uh, interesting time period in Hawaiian history uh, when they the Ali'i were seeking um, influence from the West in terms of wanting to know more about how this could influence their thinking about running the kingdom and um, Protestant missionaries came from the East Coast of the United States to be teachers there. And those were uh, two of my ancestors. And um, a number of them also went on to be influential at Punahou School as well. That's wonderful to hear. And so Coming from this background, do you think that some of your ethics and philosophical approach currently um, are derived from Christianity um, in its in its mm -hmm. form um, that was uh, you know originally developed um, by these um, missionaries? But you know, not I'm not talking about you know imperialism and things like this. But uh, do you think it's uh, somewhat based in in the Christian fold? Uh, I that's a really good question. I don't think so. Uh, I think that I am six generations removed from those original purposes. And really, the goal of progressive education and the philosophy of education of which shapes the work that I do in the world is really looking at schools of levers of change for promoting a better future society. And perhaps um, Christian forms of education were also thinking about things in this that way. But the work that we do today is non-secular and not tied to any particular religion. In fact, it's all about giving kids the opportunities to be open to multiple ways of thinking about the world, including religion, and giving them the tools to think for themselves um, about what beliefs and ethical values and perhaps spirituality and religious beliefs that they want to have as they make their way through their world. Well, let, give me some examples, because you're uh, um, in charge of this, I guess, uh, first initially sponsored by the Clarence T. C. Ching Foundation. Um, but for your for, for, when you talk about Professional Development Center, um, and I get your uh, wonderful um, emails about what's going on, what are, you, what are you trying to do? And can you give us uh, some examples of, um, of these sort of ethical and philosophical approaches to education and to children? Yeah, so a little bit of background about my current work is I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the College of Education, and the university has a partnership with Hanahaoli School, which is a 105-year-old progressive school that was founded here in Honolulu in collaboration with a number of influential East Coast philosophers and practitioners who were experimenting with this new approach to education in the late 
um, 1800s, early um, 19th late 19th century. And um, the school was really founded around this idea of we need to use education as a tool to help our democracy thrive into future generations. And what we need in a democracy is people who can think for themselves, they need to know what it means to belong to a strong and caring community where they are respectful and thoughtful of other people, that they know how to work collaboratively, that they learn by doing and then reflecting on their experience because a lot of our life experiences beyond school are not necessarily textbook bound, but through the actual experiences that we have. And we need to learn how to use those experiences, reflect on them to either improve ourselves or improve the world that we live in. And so they introduced this new philosophy of education. And my work today is about ensuring that more people have opportunity to learn about progressive education so that they can either start progressive schools of their own or implement a progressive practice in a more traditional school setting, perhaps in their classroom. So the entire project is really framed around this idea of how can we use schools to create a better future society. And my mission is to build a partnership with the university and leverage the resources of the university and the school as a living laboratory where this has been happening in practice for 105 years to give people the opportunity to experience it for themselves and then think about what this might look like in their own educational settings. Um, that's a wonderful framework. And so what comes to mind immediately um, is uh, John Dewey. And how closely are you linked uh, to the philosophy of John Dewey? We're, we're, cl we're closely linked to the philosophy of John Dewey. Um, it, Hawaii has such an interesting progressive education history. I've actually just returned from a sabbatical where I've been doing uh, some research on this. And in the late 1890s, early, early uh, wait, late 1880s, early 1990s, there was a superintendent of schools in Hawaii named H.S. Townsend. And he was learning about folks like Francis Parker and John Dewey, who were experimenting with progressive education at the University of Chicago. In Chicago, Dewey had an experimental school, uh, and Francis Parker helped run the teacher's college alongside the school where people could be learning how to teach and then experiment with that type of teaching in John Dewey's experimental lab school. And H.S. Townsend became connected to John Dewey and Francis Parker through the Castle family, um, who had a family relationship with, it's a long story, but with the um, department head at, in the philosophy department at the University of Chicago, was married to a Castle. And through that exchange, got this um, merging of intellectual ideas about how we can use schools to create a better society. And the Castles really did a lot of work of creating free kindergartens in Hawaii around that time period. And then Townsend did work to bring the ideas of Dewey and Parker to Hawaii. And he did this uh, as the principal at Lahaina Luna School, where he was experimenting with how can we have more progressive approaches in our public school system. And for, for folks that are familiar with Hawaii and Hawaii's educational history, you know that Lahaina Luna had a printing press. And so uh, Townsend and the students and teachers at Lahaina Luna produced a progressive educator newspaper that folks across the kingdom read and had teachers reading circles where they would learn about progressive education and then experiment with it in their classrooms. So just as this progressive movement was bubbling up on the East Coast of the United States and in Chicago, um, it was also flourishing here in Hawaii. In fact, we could say we might have been one of the first countries to adopt a, an, a progressive approach to education in our public school system. And so, through this relationship, long story short, John Dewey visited Hawaii three times to give a series of lectures. Uh, these lectures actually were led to the founding of the University of Hawaii, and they also built strong relationships between Dewey and a number of the folks here in Hawaii. And I'd like to think that that was part of what inspired the founding of Hanaha'oli School. Uh, the history is actually that there was a fourth grade teacher uh, from the Francis Parker School in Chicago, who is traveling across the country giving public talks on how children could learn how to read through storytelling rich environments. Sophie Judd Cook attended the talk, went up to this woman after the talk and said, I'd love to start a school array around these principles and philosophies. And so was born uh, Hanaholi School in 1918. 
And um, it was a true collaboration with these folks on the East Coast that were experimenting with this approach to education. And in fact, um, John Dewey did visit Hanaholi School. And I was going to ask you that. As Go Sophie ahead. wrote in her memoirs, he gave it the green light and said, this is everything I was thinking about when I was thinking about a progressive school. And I just want to add that um, even though it was this partnership with the East Coast from the very beginning in 1918, and I would argue the work that Townsend was doing in the public schools around the 1890s, the progressive education that bubbled up in Hawaii was very much place-based and relevant to our particular multicultural environment and living in an island in the Pacific. And um, there's a lot of early writing about this in the journal about um, using a Hawaiian epistemology to nature study to teach science, or when you look at Hanaho'oli school, the way the whole school is architecturally designed and the different languages that were involved and the strong influence of Hawaiian culture and language in the school. It was really a unique brand per, uh, per se of progressive education that got born here in the islands. Well, <clears throat> you know, from what I know, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Amber, Lahaina Luna still has a working farm and all the, in, in very Dewey-esque type of style, um, students would board there. Um, they had a boarding system um, like the, you know, fancy prep schools in the East Coast and they would um, board kids, but they actually made their own food. I mean, they, you know, they, um, you know, they harvested crops and they actually used their livestock. Um, you know, they drank the, the milk from the cows and things like this. So, you know, that's a very good example. Is this all true? This is what I've heard and read, but I wanted to make sure it was true about Lahaina Luna. Well, I'm no expert on Lahaina Luna, but I do know that when Townsend first arrived at Lahaina Luna, he was actually coming from Kamehameha schools where he was an administrator. Um, the school had kind of fallen into disrepair. And he himself traveled to Honolulu, learned about becoming a draftsman, learned about construction. And he and the students helped repair all of the buildings at the school. So I very much think that that goes along with the spirit that you're describing, um, where the progressives really saw schools as embryonic democracies. And as much as they could, they should resemble life in an ideal democracy where people are working together collaboratively and thinking together about how to make their society run as best as possible. You know, Amber, this brings up another point. Um, you know, we've discussed now, um, you know, your role at Hanaholi, and obviously this has a great history, this school, and a, a history in progressive education. Talk a little bit about your role as a professor at the University of Hawaii. Um, are you teaching classes? And of course, these students, um, if you are, would be much more mature and, you know, young adults. So how does that all work? Yeah, I have a really interesting role at the University of Hawaii. We're fortunate to have a role called specialist, uh, and my work is really meant to serve uh, the people of Hawaii through my capacity as a university professor. And so, like I've shared already, part of my role is collaborating and creating a partnership with Hanaholi School to create professional development programs for people across the state of Hawaii and beyond aligned to our progressive mission. In addition to that, uh, I also work in a teacher preparation program. I primarily work with social studies teachers. I was a high school social studies teacher at Kailua High School for over 10 years prior to coming to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So I'm able to share from my personal experience um, from teaching in the DOE, um, as well as my experience with progressive education. Uh, we also have a master's program in progressive, edu uh, progressive philosophy and pedagogy that I co-direct with Dr. Chad Miller. And this is a graduate program where folks um, get to use places like Hanaho'oli and then a number of our partner schools in the Department of Education to experiment uh, with progressive education and grow as progressive educators. And my final role at the university, I know it seems like a lot, is I collaborate uh, with the College of Arts, Languages and Letters at the Uihiro Academy for Philosophy and Ethics and Education. And the Uihiro Academy is the home of philosophy for children. And philosophy for children is a worldwide movement that was started by an academic philosopher uh, from the East Coast as well at Montclair University. And his name was Matthew Littman, and he was a philosophy professor, and he was getting students in his college level classes that he didn't think thought as well as they should or cared as much as they should for life in a democratic society. And you can tell he was influenced by the writing of John Dewey as well. 
And he believed that if you introduced philosophy into the K-12 setting, that this would help improve children's affect and their dispositions towards school, as well as their thinking. And we are so fortunate to have an incredible human, Dr. Tom Jackson, who got to learn about philosophy for children from Matthew Littman uh, as a philosophy professor here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and through his tireless uh, devotion to this work has helped to found the Uihiro Academy. And uh, what we do is support teachers and educators, researchers and scholars worldwide who are interested in learning more about philosophy for children. And you might be thinking in your head, you know, what does that mean? Are we having kids study Plato and Aristotle and Confucius? But really what it is, it's about this idea of little p philosophy. We acknowledge that there is a canon of big p philosophers that are worth reading and studying. But at, at its heart, we are all born philosophers. We're all born with wonder and asking questions and this capacity to want to think big about what is our place in the world? How does it work? How do I fit into the world? And uh, so we can use philosophy, uh, the activity of philosophy, in any classroom to help build these capacities in children. And my coming back to my story of having gone to a progressive elementary school uh, and then wanting to become a teacher and really wanting to emulate a lot of the practices that I'd experienced as a child, when I was learning to become a teacher at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I took Tom Jackson's class and it all of a sudden everything clicked. I had these ideas in my head about the type of teacher that I wanted to be learning by doing, constructivist, asking questions, learning how to think, building community. But I didn't have a classroom practice to bring that to life. And when I learned about philosophy for children, this was an actual practice that I could translate my progressive philosophy of education into the work that I did in my classroom. So for over 10 years in the Department of Education, I used philosophy for children or a philosopher's pedagogy as my approach to teaching high school social studies. That's wonderful. And, you know, you mentioned something um, as an aside, and I think it's important for our viewers to know that when you're talking about, you know, basically um, uh, the 19th century, you're talking about the Hawaii kingdom and then the territory until the 1950s of, of Hawaii and then eventually statehood. Um, also, you know, you, you brought up the DOE and your teaching in the DOE. Um, because we have a statewide Department of Education, you mm -hmm. mentioned the DOE. Does that facilitate your work, you know, because, you, you know, you're going through one one body as opposed to many school districts like you'd have on the continent. Um, so does that facilitate your um, your ability to reach teachers and students or is it, you know, a mixed bag or uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, so it's interesting the work that we do to advance progressive education and advance the progressive education movement, especially we examine this in our master's program is you can take schools like Hanaho'oli School, which from the top down is designed to be a progressive school. Um, and then we have a number of schools, um, some here in our Department of Education that are more traditional. Um, and we like to look at growing progressive education from the bottom up. And what we mean by this is philosophy for children is a completely invitational activity. Um, it's never anything that we want to force people to adopt from the top down. And we uh, work with teachers who are interested. So teachers reach out to us. They say, we've heard about philosophy for children. We've seen people doing this. We see how the kids respond. In some cases, we see how this improves test scores. Um, we'd love to work with you to grow our practice as philosophy for children practitioners. So although we have a statewide public school system, the work that we do to grow this progressive practice and to spread philosophy for children is really done by the with from the bottom up, working with individual teachers. And then in some cases, we have schools where there's a critical mass of teachers who are practicing this at their school, like Waikiki Elementary and Sunset Beach Elementary and Kailua High School and Waimanalo Elementary and Intermediate. And in addition to working with the teachers, we also work with the administration, and these become model schools, much like John Dewey's experimental school at the University of Chicago, where we have a number of teachers in the school practicing philosophy for children, and we can bring researchers and scholars and educators from across the state to come and learn about philosophy for children at these schools. So I'm not sure if that directly answers your question, but 
we don't need to use a model of a centralized school system in order to do professional development to, to spread this approach to teaching and learning. It's something very much that we do through our relationships with individual teachers, schools, and principals. So if you can, what kind of things, um, for example, are happening at, because you mentioned Waikiki Elementary School, um, what, what are kind of some of the things that are happening there, or do you know about that? Because that's kind of yeah. specific. Yeah, so, um, well, I'll, I'll speak to the influence of philosophy for children. And, you know, over the years, what we've developed is a model for schools that are interested in promoting philosophy and ethical thinking in their schools. And what this entails is, um, number one, having some sort of introductory experience where teachers get to learn about the practice of philosophy for children. And there are very specific classroom practices which involve establishing intellectual safety, building community, creating a tool uh, for turn taking in the community. And then we have a process for engaging in philosophical dialogue and thinking with one another. Um, and so we introduce teachers to this. Uh, then we also create at the school a professional community of inquiry where the teachers get to experience it with their colleagues and their peers and use philosophy in their faculty meetings to help them think about professional problems of practice. And the third part of the model is we have somebody called a philosopher in residence, who is usually usually a university professor or a graduate student from the University of Hawaii, who comes and supports the teachers who are doing um, P for C or philosophy for children at their school. So if you um, come to Waikiki School on any given day, there might be teachers um, having philosophy for children sessions in their classrooms. And in addition, you would see a philosopher in residence from the University of Hawaii that would be in those classrooms supporting their practice, thinking alongside children as they engage in philosophical inquiry, and also finding time to reflect uh, with teachers afterwards and build their practice. And over the years, um, Waikiki Elementary has just grown exponentially its philosophy for children practice. And alongside that, they've adopted um, a program called Habits of Mind, where they're also teaching kids critical habits of mind that help with ethical engagement and, and thinking about the world that they live in. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of glimpse. I, I could even paint a better picture of what a philosophy for children session looks like. Um, but Tom Jackson has been the philosopher in residence at Waikiki School for years, um, as well as my colleagues, uh, Toby Yost and Chad Miller and Ben Lukey. That's really wonderful, and uh, you've got the you've got the key guy with uh, Professor Jackson there. I, I see. So, if if you're coming into an elementary school and you have to give um, the first lesson, what do you talk to the kids about in terms of philosophy and ethics? Yeah, it's interesting. We really like to make clear that it's really difficult to do good thinking if you don't feel intellectually safe and you don't feel like you're a part of a community. You really can't separate good thinking with some of those social emotional elements of school. And so on our very first day with children, what we do is we establish intellectual safety. And this is the idea that you can ask any question or state any point of view as long as you're respectful of everyone in the classroom. And to do this, we make a tool called the community ball. Um, and what it involves is sharing some answers to questions that relate to yourself, relate to what you're gonna study in the classroom. And we literally work with kids to make this yarn ball that then we then cut and create, and it becomes a tool for turn-taking during our philosophical inquiries. And what those look like is kids sitting in a circle, uh, kids generating questions about things that they wonder about, putting all of those questions up on the board, then allowing children to vote on the question that they wanna talk about the most, and then the student's question who gets chosen becomes the student that starts our inquiry and they take the community ball and share their initial thinking about it. And then we use the community ball to take turns as a class. But really the first day is about making sure it's a safe place where they feel like they can share their ideas and, and make mistakes and, and help each other correct their thinking and get better at it. Um that's interesting. So like the first day is, or maybe the first week is laying down the rules of engagement as it were? A hundred percent. A lot of uh, progressive education is about a lot of planning ahead of time by teachers and putting structures in place so that you can have an authentic experience that's student-led and where students are engaged and um, 
yes, the very first day is setting up what are those rules of how we're going to agree to think together uh, for the rest of the year. You know, one, um, we're running out of time here, but in the last couple of minutes, what I'd like you to do, Amber, is talk about um, how do you get at ethical issues, especially if the kids are young? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I mean, I, there are certain things you probably don't want to talk about uh, with uh, young children, but maybe you do. So um, how do you deal with the ethical part of your job? Well, uh, children are born curious. Um, they are observing a lot more about the world we live in than many times adults give them credit for. And in the work that we do, we really want the questions to come from children. And so as children are experiencing the world around them, whether that be in their families, whether it be something they saw on the news as they get increasingly older in social media, uh, we ask them to generate questions about things that they're curious from. And from there, we build out the inquiry. And uh, the ways in which adults support this, right, is that they're able to offer additional perspectives or points of view, or they start to think about, wow, the, the children are really interested in fairness. Here's a story I'm going to go find from the library that might bolster our thinking around this. But I think the most important thing when we're talking about approaching ethical issues with children is that it starts from their own wonder and their curiosity about the world, and oftentimes things that they're finding problematic and that they have deeper questions that they really need adults to think alongside um, with them. And so what we're really doing is providing a safe space to ask those questions, and then we're giving them tools to think about those questions responsibly with others where they can hear multiple perspectives and points of view. You know, um, you ended with a very nice um, comment, um, and I think it it touches on both uh, philosoph your philosophical approach and your ethical approach, and that is that there are many, many different uh, points of view and ways of getting at um, different intellectual issues. And I, I think that's such a such a, a nice way um, to um, end this. But I have one last question: Is so will you continue this work, or are you are you um, investigating other work? Um, you were talking about writing, doing some um, work about John Dewey coming to Hawaii. Um, what's your what's the future look like uh, for uh, Dr. Amber uh, Makayao? I am one hundred percent committed to continuing this work here in Hawaii. I um, am currently really focused on how do we strengthen university and school partnerships to help use schools to create a better future society. And I think this is something that Dewey and Parker were really trying to crack at the University of Chicago over 130 years ago. And so I'm determined to find um, institutional structures where we can be working as a larger system of education to make the lives of children and our communities better, as well as our planet that so desperately needs our attention. So more to come um, along the same strand, but I too like to approach my life as an examined life and I go where the inquiry takes me uh, and use my experience to build on what I know to help support the work of others that are interested in doing this work as well. Well, um, Dr. Amber Makao, we are so grateful for your um, discussion of your philosophical and ethical approach to education and uh, in the larger context of uh, the Dewey-esque Dewey progressive education. Thank you for being a member of this uh, podcast. And uh, for all of those watching, uh, Journeys of the Mind comes out every two weeks, and we hope you will spread the news. And of course, anything you can contribute to Think Tech Hawaii would be much appreciated. Aloha. Thank you.